Okay, thank you everyone for joining us online. Um, I am Jen Daskal. I am a professor and faculty director of a new tech law and security program at American University Washington College of Law. And I'd like to welcome you to the latest installment of our free speech project, Moved Online. Um, this has been a year long joint project between our tech law and security program and Future Tense, a collaboration of Slate, New America, and ASU. Over the course of this year, we are tackling a range of issues dealing with the ways in which online communications are challenging our notions of and commitments to free speech. Um, we had planned um, a longer in-person discussion about political ads, and we are instead breaking that up into shorter um, online one hour segments. Um, and this is the first one where we are gonna be talking about what we can learn from regulation of ads on broadcast TV to the online environment. We have, um, as is apparent, um, a really amazing um, group of pet two panelists, um, uh, Commissioner Ellen Weintraub um, and Rick Ka Kaplan. Um, Commissioner Weintraub is the commissioner of, on the Federal Election Commission, where she's served since 2002, um, and she's been a chair for three times. Um, her latest appointment as a chair began in 2019. Prior to her appointment at the Federal Election Commission, she was of counsel to the political law group of Perkins and Cooey, and she was a counsel at the House Ethics Committee. Rick Kaplan um, is the General Counsel and Executive Vice President of Legal and Regulatory Affairs at the National Association of, Association of Broadcasters. He joined the National Association of Broadcasters in 2012 um, and was named General Counsel in 2014. And he also has served um, on, the F, um, on a number of different roles, including in leadership capacities at the federal um, at, the, at the FCC. Um, so I am going to start um, by turning it to Rick and asking Rick to talk a little bit about the rules on political ad broadcasting. What are the, what are the, what are the limits? What are the requirements with respect to access, with respect to payment and disclosure limitations? Sure, and thanks so much, and thanks uh, for having me on this uh, virtual uh, panel. Uh, I was hoping to join you all in person, but glad that uh, we were still able to do this. Um, there are a panoply of different regulations that apply to over-the-air broadcasters when it comes to political advertising. I'm going to try and touch on some of the outlines, the contours, that hopefully will give us some uh, basis for the conversation that I know folks are interested in today. Um, and they can be fairly technical, so I'll try and stay out of some of the more technical things. But the, the general rule is that legally qualified candidates, and I'll explain what that means in a, in a minute for federal office, um, are entitled to reasonable access to use broadcast facilities. And broadcasters must provide equal opportunities to all opposing candidates for the same office. Uh, in addition, during specific periods preceding an election, which is what we refer to as the political window, candidates are entitled to the lowest advertising rate. And I'll, I'll put a little meat on the bones in that in a second. A legally qualified candidate is one who announced publicly an intention to run for public office and is also qualified to hold that office. Now, only federal candidates actually have a right of reasonable access to use the station's facilities. Uh, interesting that Congress put that in there. Um, <clears throat> now, stations are not required to sell time to state and local candidates, but if they do, then the rules for equal time and sponsor identification, uh, no censorship, and lowest unit rate do apply. Equal time is an interesting one that many people uh, know about, <clears throat> which is that a station must provide uh, equal time to opponents of a candidate that uses the station upon request, and that equal time must be given within seven days. So you, you will occasionally hear about this as we get closer to the presidential election. You'll see examples of you know, somebody <clears throat> appeared on, say, Saturday Night Live or something like that. Was the, the, does that one candidate did? Does that mean the other one gets equal time on the network? So those things uh, frequently come up. Lowest unit rate, you may be wondering a little bit what that is. You may not be familiar, and this is you know, quite a, uh, a big development over the last couple of decades, but 45 days before primary or 60 days before a general election, stations, stations must charge candidates what's called the lowest rate charged to any other advertiser for the same kind of time. 
And what that means is, you know, if it's something in the middle of the night, it's obviously different than something in the middle of the day. Um, and so, but you have to give them the lowest unit charge. Um, but that's only, if, now we're talking about candidate ads and we'll, as we move through this uh, panel discussion, you'll see there's a, there's a stark difference between candidate ads, those sponsored by a candidate and issue ads, which are sponsored by third parties. So um, the lowest unit charge only relates to candidate uh, ads. Um, a couple of quick things important to know, I think as we discuss uh, the things today that we're gonna address, um, federal candidates must certify whether or not the ad refers to an opponent. And if so, it must state in the ad uh, that she or he has approved the ad. The ad must also state that it is quote unquote paid for or sponsored by the entity paying for the spot. And a lot of you are familiar with seeing that in the ads you watch on TV. One last thing to point out too that's um, uh, unique here for broadcasters is that stations must maintain what's called a political file. And that's now online. It used to be just kept at the station, but now it's, it's online for anyone to see if you go to the FCC website or station websites have them too, links to them as well. Um, and these political files allow the public to obtain information about political ads and to enable candidates to avail themselves of equal time. So in other words, the, the, and this was the original theory uh, behind political ads is that if I'm running for office and I'm you know, checking on the stations in my state, if it's a uh, Senate uh, uh, campaign and I can then see, oh, my candidate actually ran a bunch of ads on this station, it gives me an opportunity uh, to do that. It also gives me an opportunity to demand equal time if I see they're on there. So, um, and the required information is actually pretty substantial. It includes the rates charged, when the uh, ad aired, relevant candidate and office sought, uh, the treasurer or of the campaign committee, and whether the ad communicates a message related to, again, this is a term of art, any political matter of national importance. Um, the all in, so I'll just wrap this up here, <clears throat> all these regulations, and there, there are more, but this is, these are kind of the nuts and bolts. Um, you know, the, the challenge as we look at all these regulations is that, um, is that broadcasters um, are under a lot of pressure here. The one sort of practical problem is broadcasters are subject to enforcement for violations uh, but collection of the required information from candidates can be outside our control. So if you think about it, the ad agency provides a broadcaster with the information. And so there's a, that's one major step, uh, you know, and, and the FCC, which regulates these, and I'm going to be about to be clear here, especially with the commissioner on the Federal Communications Commission. <laughs> so between the SEC, the FCC, and the FEC, it's all confusing. But the Federal Communications Commission re regulates this um, and so they don't regulate advertisers though. They regulate broadcasters. We hold the licenses. So that's, so we are ultimately responsible, uh, even though we actually often don't have access to the, to the information. And the other thing that's, that's critical here too is the timing. Stations have to upload disclosure within, typically within 24 hours um, of, of the ad being placed. So that's you know, obviously is a fast moving cycle. And you can imagine when you get closer to an election, that's uh, pretty action packed. Okay, so you've just described a fair number of rules. You've talked about rules requiring equal access. You've talked about rules um, setting limits on how much can be charged. And you've talked about rules requiring disclosure of candidate ads. Commissioner Weintraub, how does that compare to the world of online political advertising? What, what rules are in play there? Well, I wanna start out, first of all, thank you for, uh, for having me. Uh, I wanna start out by saying that what the FEC does and what the FCC does, there's some overlap, but there's also a lot of differences. We are primarily a disclosure agency. Uh, we are all about money and politics. So our primary mission is to make sure that all of the candidates and the political parties and the PACs and the super PACs, that they are all disclosing to the American people how much money they are spending and, and what they're spending it on. So uh, to the extent that those players are spending money on online ads, that should show up in their, dis in their regular disclosure reports if they are regular reporting entities. But there are other folks that run ads that are not regular reporting entities. They are not political committees. And, and they still may have disclosure requirements if they're spending enough money on advertising. And, and that comes up in two separate buckets. There's what we call independent expenditures, which are ads that are directly advocating that somebody vote for or against a candidate. And then there's what we call electioneering communications. Electioneering communications 
are ads that are run within proximity to an election. We have our own set of time windows. Everybody's got time windows. So ads that are run within 30 days of a primary or uh, 60 days of a general election that are targeted to the electorate for that particular candidate and just mention the candidate's name. They don't have to urge a vote for or against that candidate. All they have to do is mention the candidate's name and then that falls into the electioneering communications bucket which has its own disclosure requirements and 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 disclaimer requirements. So um, the reason why that's important and significant in the online context is that any ad that, that is run by a political committee online has to have information about who's paying for it. And as I said, if they are a regular political committee, they will be disclosing the money side of it in their regular reports to the FEC. But if it is an electioneering communication, then um, uh, all right, let me back up. The, the, um, if, if, if a group other than a political committee is running an independent expenditure, is urging a vote directly for or against a candidate, that's got to have the disclaimer requirements on it. Um, and they have certain reporting requirements to the commission. Um, if it is an electioneering communication, however, that is defined as an ad that is run on broadcast satellite or cable. So if the ad does not directly advocate for or against a candidate, and they're not soliciting money, they're not soliciting political contributions, and it's not run by a political committee, then there's not a lot that we can do about that. That really does not fall, um, uh, there, there, there are not a lot of requirements that are associated with that. And uh, that is the problem that uh, since most ads actually are more likely to fall into that bucket, you don't really need to say vote for the candidate in order to convey the message that you want somebody to vote for the candidate or to the contrary to vote against that candidate. Uh, and particularly the outside spending groups who are the least likely to have the regular reporting requirements, they often will run the negative ads, uh, the ones that are just, you know, boy, this is really a terrible person. They don't need to say don't vote for that person. That, that, that's why we have this category of election year and communications. And that is what the Honest Ads Act is trying to, uh, to correct for, is to uh, bring the internet ads that are talking about candidates in proximity to an election under the same reporting regime as um, broadcast cable and satellite ads. Right, so the, the Honest Ads Act, just to back up for a second, the Honest Ads Act, um, as probably everybody on this, on this webinar knows, but just in case, is sponsored by a bipartisan piece of legislation in both the House and the Senate, and the Senate side, it was spon it's sponsored by Senators Klobuchar, Warner, and Graham. Um, and then, as I said, there's also a bipartisan bill in the House. And they've described this bill as, and I'm quoting from, from language in press releases, ensuring that political ads sold online are covered by the same rules as ads sold on TV, radio, and satellite. Commissioner Rentrev, is that an accurate description of, of what the Honest Ads Act does? And is that even possible? Is it possible to hold online communications to the same standards as broadcast communication? I don't know why not. Um, the, um, and I do think it's an accurate um, description. What it technically does, as I said, is expands the definition of electioneering communications to include online ads in addition to broadcast cable and, and satellite. And one really notable distinction is that we don't have, beyond what's in the FCC uh, Act, we don't have in the Federal Election Campaign Act, a requirement for maintaining this kind of a public file. Uh, we, we don't, they, they handle the public file of the, the actual database of ads. We don't have that function. And what the Honest Ads Act would do is require platforms, the larger platforms, to maintain a file of all of these ads, which right now there is no such requirement in contrast to the ads that people run on broadcast. And I think that's, that's really important. Some of the platforms are doing that on a voluntary basis, but I think it would be uh, really better for everyone to all be on the same playing field. Everybody have the same set of requirements, no matter which platform you're talking about, and, and for their to be a uniform set of requirements on that. Well, that sounds pretty reasonable. Why is there, I know, that, I know you're not a proponent or an opponent, you, you're not in the position, you're not advocating for the Honest Ads Act, but what's, what's the basis for the opposition to the Honest Ads Act then? 
Unfortunately, anything that smacks of campaign finance reform gets some people's backs up and they say, no, no, we don't want to do that. Um, and unfortunately, it, it has become a pretty partisan issue where um, it's, it's just right now, it's almost impossible to get anything that uh, in any way touches on campaign finance legislation through the Senate. It's just not going anywhere. And that's despite the fact that it has bipartisan support. So Rick, back to you for a second. And the Honest Ads Act um, is based largely on the presumption that the broadcast rules got it right and they should be applied to the online environment. Um, is that, do you, do you agree with that? And, and what's missing? What, what do we do about, I mean, so far we've been talking about ads that um, either are for or against particular candidates or mention candidates by names, but let's, does the Honest Ads Act help us with issue ads or what should we be doing about issue ads as well? Well, so, you know, I think the Honest Ads Act is attempting to, you know, as the commissioner said, apply more broadly the rules that exist for, for broadcasters. Um, <clears throat> when we think um, through these issues, we generally have, you know, three kind of lenses through which we look at them. Uh, and first, um, for broadcasters, this is very specific to us, we become concerned with having to comply with two different regimes. Uh, any you know, we've seen these, but this, by the way, is something at the state level too, you're seeing more state level laws come up uh, of this sort. Uh, in fact, one was recently struck down in Maryland and Maryland is trying to, to, to do it again um, to come up with a new formula that, that meets the First Amendment. But we're, broadcasters are, are, are often worried about complying with FCC rules and then having a different one for their online uh, entity. So in other words, a broadcaster will have its station, but that station has a website. And then if you have two different regimes, that gets uh, somewhat difficult. Um, you know, second, we, we don't typically seek to add regulations for others. So, you know, oh, we have to do it, they have to do it. But as the commissioner said, I think uh, a level playing field um, does make sense. Uh, it's something that's, you know, I think is, and we, we see where um, the sponsors of the bill are, are coming from in that regard. And third, you know, we do worry, and one of the tough things for platforms, in this case broadcasters, but I think this would apply universally, is the, the very difficult piece of who is responsible for getting the information. Um, the FCC has struck a balance uh, where there's certain things that like with issue ads, as you mentioned with issue ads, broadcasters now need to at least ask the question uh, and try to get the information. Um, but if we were trying to and responsible for getting all of the information and if we ran into some walls, what that means, we don't have access to it. So. Um, you know, there is a, an enforcement issue here, which is quite complicated because, you know, perhaps it's the advertisers, you know, the ones uh, that should be regulated here, but there's no natural fit for where that would go. So it's, 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 somewhat, um, it's somewhat complicated. Um, the other thing, as I mentioned before, is well, with the Honest Ads Act, and I should say, you know, we certainly appreciate and support transparency and what the act is trying to accomplish. There's a, there's a lot about the idea behind the act that makes a lot of sense, we get where it's coming from. Um, the, the rationale, as I mentioned before, and this is something I think we need to grapple with, has shifted it over time, kind of morphed as to what political advertising and, and um, you know, disclosure is for. Again, it used to be for, and where this all started, was equal opportunity rights. Uh, and then over time, you know, it sort of became, um, you know, more about getting uh, to find out who's behind the money. Uh, and then, you know, I'm not sure that's best left with broadcasters or even social media at the first instance because someone has to go through all that information. Uh, you know, maybe it is better through the FEC or something like that uh, to have the folks doing the ads or the ones uh, responsible for providing the information so you can get the transparency the Honest Ads Act is looking for. Let's turn to this, this question of issue ads. Um, it's now been raised a few different times. Um, first, before we even start talking about how we think about regulating issue ads, how do we, how do we define them? What's, how would you define an issue ad? <laughs> That's the uh, $100,000 question. Um, it, uh, you know, so issue advertising applies to ballot issues or ads that involve uh, controversial issues of public importance. Um, and if you can define that for me, I'd be very excited because we struggle with this one all the time. But it's ads about elections, um, but ones that are not, these are ads that are not sponsored by candidates or their official committees. So uh, for uh, folks who are you know, not super involved in this, it's the ads you see you know, from PACs, super PACs, things like that. Um, those, those are issue advertisements that are, that are not sponsored by the candidate. And so those, those ads have 
slightly different regulations. So for example, uh, broadcasters um, uh, now in the FCC recently uh, clarified this, have to uh, put in our public file uh, any, uh, and I say public file should be clear for those not uh, up on the FCC, the public file is a broader file that includes the political file where we are addressed putting these things. So in our political file, we have to put in, um, if there are ads of national import, if there are issue ads that uh, cover areas of national importance, um, that we have to include those and list all of the issues to the best of our ability um, uh, in, in those ads. So an ad might be simple and just be about healthcare uh, from a national debate, or uh, a PAC may sponsor an ad that covers three, four, or five ad, uh, issues. And again, we need to list all of those issues uh, to the best of our ability when we put that in the, in the public file so that folks looking at it can, can tell what the ad was about. It, let me just say that from the FEC perspective that uh, issue ads, it's not a, def, it, it's sort of um, not defined by what it is so much as what it isn't. It's not a direct advocacy ad. Um, it's supposedly uh, an ad that talks about issues and therefore should be less regulated than an ad that talks directly about candidates and who you should vote for. But there have been many, many ads that um, were run by folks who said they were issue ads, where the issue turned out to be the character qualifications and fitness for office of a particular candidate. Uh, and this is where we've got the whole concept of electioneering communications because Congress was uh, became convinced that there were many, many ads out there that stopped short of express advocacy and yet were pretty plainly about the election and that the public deserved information about this. That's, that's the other side of, of this that I think is important to emphasize and that the Supreme Court has emphasized in upholding various disclosure laws, that the electorate, the American public has a right to know who is behind the advertising that is going on about candidates and who's trying to influence their votes. And it is um, really significant and important to an informed electorate. It's hard to have an informed electorate if that kind of information is not out there. Right now, uh, over the last number of years, we've been seeing a real migration of political advertising to uh, the internet. Uh, we're now seeing billions of dollars being spent online on political advertising. So to leave that category of advertising out of the equation really would leave the American electorate very shortchanged in terms of the information that they have. And Jennifer, I should, I should add uh, to the, the commissioner said, because um, uh, one, one thing you had asked was th these ads actually, and it's important when you have the distinction you're making between candidate and issue ads are actually quite important for people to understand how this all works because they're not subject uh, to the same rules of the FCC as, as candidate ads. So for example, uh, an issue ad is not entitled to reasonable access. Um, it's not entitled to equal, it wouldn't entitle someone to equal time. Um, so that, and that it used to, there's something called the fairness doctrine. I think many people are familiar with it. If you covered one side of an issue, you'd have to cover the other side of the issue, but that's not the case anymore. Also, it's not, uh, importantly, when we talk about money, it's not uh, subject to the lowest unit rate uh, as well. So that's for candidate ads, but not for issue ads. Another interesting thing, I think people would find this interesting at least, is that uh, whereas you can't do this in candidate ads, stations um, can censor third party ads. Um, so if the, and this is, you see the controversies bubble up over time about ads that kind of uh, shocked certain people and they thought you, the station may not run it. We always see this running up to an election uh, for issue ads, they can be censored. Commissioner, I want, to, I want to pick up on this uh, a little bit and, and go a little further. So we saw, I mean, this is obviously became a big issue in the wake of Twitter's announcement that it was going to ban all political ads. Um, and um, whenever one thinks about that, the reality was in the aftermath of that, Twitter struggled to define what counts as a political ad. Um, and um, they weren't just limited to the definition of election electioneering communication, because that was about a particular candidate, but they were looking at, again, when you start talking about issues of national importance, how do you, how do you go about defining that? And should, should that be something, should there be a role for the FEC in, in helping companies have a standard definition? What, how do we think about the, the full range of ads that ought to be regulated, particularly when, as you point out, um, a lot of advertising is happening online and a lot of influence operations are happening online that don't necessarily even mention a political candidate by name. 
Uh, yes, I, I think that that raises um, a really difficult issue. And, and let me say that this whole concept of ads of, on issues of national importance, that doesn't come out of what we regulate. The, F, the FEC doesn't get into that kind of content regulation. Um, but I understand, and, and as I said, the, the, um, the way around that in the Federal Election Campaign Act is to uh, look at the ads that talk about candidates within proximity to an election, this concept of electioneering communications, which some people in the campaign finance world probably would uh, define as issue ads. And, and they might be, or they, or they might not be, they might be more direct uh, candidate ads. Um, but I, I do think that we have seen a lot of influence operations and the most disturbing ones coming from, um, from foreign countries. You know, we saw that in 2016 and uh, the, the range of intelligence agencies um, uh, a few months ago um, came out with a statement warning uh, Americans that they were expecting to see more of that in this election cycle. Um, from Russia, from China, from Iran. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very concerned right now about misinformation and disinformation um, that sort of overlays health issues around the uh, coronavirus with electoral issues, um, uh, because plainly this is going to be a big issue in the election. And uh, it's really important that people get accurate information about health information uh, and about what their government is and isn't doing about that, what the federal government is doing, what the state governments are doing. So um, this, this raises really not, not only questions of the health of our democracy, but also the health of our citizens, and in some cases could be life or death issues. Now, having said all that, you know, the, the FEC is not situated and has never never sought the uh, ability to, to um, or the authority to try and regulate sort of truth in advertising, to try and um, uh, tell people whether ads were true or false or, or, or to comment on them in that way. But I do think the platforms have taken at least some steps uh, towards tr some, some set of issues that they're willing to weigh in on and, and try and um, uh, promote more accurate information or at least inform people when the information is not accurate. And, and that is something that I think everyone really ought to be paying a very close attention to how they go about doing that because it's going to vary from one platform to another and I don't think any of them are going to be able to really take a hands-off attitude on this and and let's face it they're, they're not neutral pipelines they're not just you know sort of transmitting information they have algorithms they're promoting some messages and demoting other messages and and they have some responsibility i think in this in this information environment for for making taking some set steps to ensure that people are getting accurate information so i want to pick up on this on this question of foreign influence and um obviously you know Foreigners cannot buy ads uh, advocating for or against candidates or political parties. Well, they're not supposed to. <laughs> not supposed to. Um, but there's not an equivalent bar on foreigners buying issue ads. So, Rick, I'm wondering whether that's something that should be addressed somehow, or, or we ought to be concerned about, about that kind of influence. And if so, what do we do? You know, it hasn't been a major issue for broadcasters. You know, foreign, the, the whole issue of foreign influence elections um, has been far more in the context of large social media platforms. Um, and so, so it's not something that broadcasters typically run into. And actually, even with large social media platforms, the foreign influencers often were, didn't seem to be focused on purchasing political ads um, on those platforms, we're, we're engaging in other ways with other types of content, you know, creating social media web pages, using false personas online, uh, things like that. Um, so, you know, any regulations applicable to political advertisements may not even reach a significant port, uh, uh, portion of the foreign based online activity that has concerned a lot of people. In fact, we saw this come up somewhat in the Maryland law I referenced earlier in the it went to district court and then the fourth circuit uh, upheld the district court striking down the law um, 
and the court was concerned about applying overly broad, uh, applying the law overly broadly, including to, to media platforms that were not the source of the concern. So it's something we have to, it's, it's certainly an important issue, there's no question. Um, it's not clear, it certainly doesn't really impact broadcasters one way or another much, but for the overall conversation, uh, it's not clear whether political ads is a way to get at the you know, main concern that at least you know, I've heard voiced. Commissioner, I'm um, going to turn the same question back to you, but ask um, more specifically about one set of policies that uh, at least Facebook has adopted, where they have now, they now require authentication before buying an ad. And one of the things that's needed in order to authenticate oneself is an ID and some sort of mailing address, which operates as kind of a de facto ban on foreigners um, buying political ads, which are defined not just as ads for against particular candidates, but also ads on issues of national importance. Um, is there, I mean, is that an approach that makes sense? Is there a risk that we inadvertently you know, kind of keep out legitimate voices of, of, and perspectives of, of foreigners in, in policy issues, which we may want to hear their voices as well at the same time that we're trying to deal with concerns about people. Well, um, let me say a couple of things. First of all, um, FEC regulations say that foreign nationals are not allowed to make any kind of disbursements in connection with a US election, federal, state, or local. So that in connection with, with language is actually pretty broad uh, and, um, and could well cover more than express advocacy ads. So I, I don't, I, I'm not willing to stipulate that that the law as it stands right now only covers express advocacy when it comes to foreign spending. And, and the leading case on this, interestingly enough, the, uh, the Blumen case, which was uh, authored by then Judge Kavanaugh when he was back on the DC circuit, um, went in a different direction than a lot of people thought it was going to go in when it came to looking at foreign spending in our elections. He, he said it didn't implicate the great debates over the First Amendment and, and campaign finance that we've been having over the last number of decades, but rather went to the definition of our political community. And, um, and, and his opinion is steeped in language about who we want to influence the US government and how it is a legitimate concern to ensure that non-Americans, non-US citizens do not have the same say in how our government works in, in, in influencing our elections and the, and the US government itself that US citizens do. So I think that there is indeed some, some play there, some, some room for additional um, uh, statutes and, and regulation in this area. I, I don't think that the platforms have gone too far. Um, I mean, they, they have taken some steps in, in trying to ensure that it is U.S. citizens who are, who are buying political ads, but at the same time, it's my understanding that um, Facebook, for example, once they verify that, they, you can identify yourself any way you want on a Facebook ad. You could say paid for by Mickey Mouse and they're not gonna say that that's, oh, we, we looked at the person's credit card so we know it's not Mickey Mouse. So I, I think they could actually uh, go further than they already have in ensuring that the American people get the kind of transparency that the Supreme Court has already endorsed uh, in terms of the importance of this information to the electorate. And I do think that this is a, this is not in any way a hypothetical concern. I think we are going to see this. I think the platforms could take stronger steps to identify and root out inauthentic content. Um, uh, I don't believe that bots have First Amendment rights. Maybe corporations have First Amendment rights, but I don't think bots have First Amendment rights. So I, I think that um, uh, stronger action to take down uh, bots would be uh, constitutional, I believe. And um, I, I think we should see better identification of manipulated media. Uh, I think there's a lot of concern out there. We're not, I don't think the technology is there quite yet for uh, really persuasive deep fakes, but we're certainly getting there. Uh, and uh, there, there's been a, a lot of what they call either cheap fakes or shallow fakes um, uh, that have been uh, going around online. And uh, I would like to see the platforms do a better job of identifying when the media has been manipulated so that people can, can again, it, it goes to whether you can trust what you see. Right. The, the transparency and disclosure points um, are incredibly important. Um, 
the the earlier part of the conversation I think again highlights the the, the difficulties of defining political ads. Um, there is, a, in my view, there's a difference between an ad that's in connection with an election and an ad that's about any issue of national importance and defining that line and finding appropriate rules and standards that make that distinction and, and abide by it, I think are incredibly, incredibly difficult. I wanna um, remind the listeners to please submit questions. We are going to turn to those shortly. Um, before we do, um, Commissioner, I wanna turn back to you again. You wrote a terrific piece in November in the Washington Post, I commend it to everybody about um, the dangers of um, micro-targeting and a response in part to Twitter's decision to just ban all political ads saying, don't ban all political ads, instead focus on this other more important problem, which is micro-targeting. Can you talk a little bit about your proposal and your concerns that, that led you to write this piece? Sure, thank you. Um, so my concern about micro-targeting is that the platforms, they, they get all this information about us and we don't even, most users don't even think about how much information about ourselves we are conveying and just kind of handing over to the platforms. Uh, every time we click on something or we share something, we like something, we overlook something, the platforms are just scooping all this data up about us. And, they, and, and this is their business model. They use this to target ads exactly to the people who are most going to be susceptible to them. Now, there, we, can, we can debate whether that's a great thing when they're selling soap, but when they're, when they're selling ads about candidates, when they're selling political ads, I think it really does raise some serious First Amendment issues. The, the jurisprudence that we have from the, from the Supreme Court about the First Amendment celebrates the role of a robust debate. And if you don't like what one person is saying, well, you don't want to take down that speech, you want to counter that speech by coming up with a better argument on the other side. Micro-targeting eliminates that possibility because only this narrow segment of, of individuals are going to see that individual ad that is hand-selected and designed by, by the AI for you based on on what they have already gleaned about you. And, and none of this is, as I said, sort of a conscious process on the consumer part of just kind of handing all this information over for the purpose of, of uh, being used as, a, as a, an advertising guinea pig. And if information is being conveyed this way through micro-targeting, particularly now at a time when everybody is online all the time. You're not gathered around the water cooler these days talking to people about what you read online last night. You're just sitting there staring at your computer screen all day long. And by the way, people should at a safe distance get outside. It's a beautiful day out today in Washington. Get some fresh air. Um, don't, don't sit online all day. The, um, uh, the, but it really undermines our our notion of what how to how to best promote a wide open and robust debate where everybody can mix it up and the best ideas will triumph in the end if if the only people who are seeing the ads are the ones who are susceptible to them and you're not seeing the same ads as as your next door neighbor or maybe even the person sitting across from you at the dinner table. So what I suggested was that when it comes to selling political ads, the platform should on their own. This I'm not I'm not suggesting this as a as a form of of as a as a new regulation that the FEC would adopt, but I am suggesting that the platforms who benefit and and have thrived uh, in our democracy from our from all the protections that they get both from the First Amendment and uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, that that they should in the interest of protecting the First Amendment, protecting robust debate, protecting our democracy, that they should not allow this kind of micro-targeting of, uh, of political ads and rather make sure that the ads go to a wide enough audience that people can pick them apart. People can see what's being uh, sent to other folks and, and can raise new arguments against them and, and that the advertisers themselves, be they candidates or third party spenders, will be held accountable for the messages that they're putting out. And if I remember correctly, your, your, the article you, you wrote, you proposed specific standards that, ad, that advertisers for political ads could only target one level lower than 
than the level of the election. So yeah, except at, if you're running a national election, you could go down two levels. So you could, if you're running for Congress, you could go down to the county level for micro-targeting. If you're running for uh, the presidency, you could go down to a congressional district. You wouldn't have to just be limited to the entire nation or, the, or, or an entire state. But, but to make sure that enough people see the ad, that there can be a real response to it if, if people choose to respond. Um, and what the platforms have all chosen different um, ways of addressing this. The, uh, as you said, Twitter is trying to get out of the political advertising business. They didn't have a big political advertising business to begin with. So, you know, maybe it wasn't a, it, that was the easiest way for them to handle it. Um, Facebook really, um, after claiming they were thinking about it very, very hard for a long time, they said, you know what? No, we're not, we're going to continue to allow micro-targeting and political ads. Google had an approach that was somewhat in between. They said they wouldn't allow micro-targeting below the level of zip code, age, and gender. So that was, that was the closest to what I had suggested, but uh, it is still pretty uh, a pretty narrow uh, range of people. If you if you think about you know the typical zip code is about um, eight thousand people. Uh, if you divide that again by age and gender, you're you're going to be slicing it pretty much much thinner than I had proposed. But again, it's the closest to to what I had suggested. And and how so? Obviously, you're you're you've identified a real problem that your proposals and these kinds of proposals are trying to solve. How do you respond to the concern that sometimes raised that you know, newcomers to the, to the political, people who are trying to enter the market in the first time, small scale candidates, really benefit from the ability of being able to micro-target because it makes it less expensive for them to reach their intended audience. And if they have to, if they're forced to expend more because they, they're forced to reach a, a big audience, it's just gonna make it that much harder for them to actually enter the race and potentially shake things up politically. Well, I mean, small scale candidates are going to be running in smaller scale races, so they won't have to reach as many people. Small scale candidates aren't usually running national campaigns, so they 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 still wouldn't have to advertise to that many people. Uh, and um, uh, I I'd like to say that I this is not. I, I'm glad that I was able to move the debate forward on this issue. I'm not the only person who has suggested this. Some really smart people in the uh, in in the tech world have uh, come up with similar proposals. People like Alex Stamos and Yael Eisenstadt, you know, that people that I really respect a lot, uh, and that gives me a lot more confidence that this is not a crazy idea that I came up with. So Rick, I'm going to turn back to you, give you a chance to, to weigh in on, on thoughts on, on any of those issues, but also wanted to direct um, one of our audience questions to you, which was, um, you talked at the beginning about equal time. Um, the question was, can you clarify what you mean by equal time? Is it equal opportunity to buy equivalent a time or is it something other than that? Yeah, so equal opportunity. So when I was referring to it earlier, I was when I started at the very top, I was talking about uh, in the context of political advertising uh, for being able to, to, to buy within the political window. Right. Okay. And to, to react to what the commissioner is saying, and again, um, this isn't a, a, a broadcaster heavy issue, obviously, so speaking you know, just for myself, um, you know, I think it's, it's very provocative, very interesting. You know, Twitter probably went you know, too far, and maybe the commissioner even. I agree you know, with that. We know why, um, uh, because uh, the commissioner, what what she's trying to address is something, right? Is is a, is, a, is is not a step that far. Is you don't have to eliminate political advertising, right? So, um, and the the question uh, would then be: Is the government doing it, or are companies doing it? If companies do it themselves, um, certainly. Um, you know, you avoid the first any First Amendment problems, and that's you know maybe something companies should do. Other things that have been proposed are better ability to block. You know, Facebook talked about that. People have complained that oh, it actually wasn't very useful. Um, but there's lots of ways to get at this. But it's but I think the 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 big point the commissioner raises that's that's important is that a robust conversation is what we're looking for, uh, and things gained you know and, and and or things furthered in pursuit of that is. Is, is what the goal is here. And, and if there are things that are derailing that, um, then, that's, then that's a problem. But, but micro-targeting, you know, in and of itself, is it a bad thing? I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, it seems like you know, there, there are many cases where that might be in, important. And you know, even there might be less well-funded congressional campaigns who are struggling to get noticed, especially early, early on, might wanna make use of it. 
uh, but it, 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 it's a slippery slope. Another, another audience question, I'll turn this one back to you again, Rick, to start, and then I'll, I'll turn back to you, Commissioner, um, about the, the question of truth in advertising. How, what's the role, um, starting with broadcasters, what's the role of broadcasters to make sure that the advertisers are telling the truth, and, and how, is, how did that work? Again, very, very challenging. It's a great question. Um, <clears throat> broadcasters often end up in the middle of fights between campaigns over, I mean, we see this all the time, right? Um, uh, whether something was truthful or not. Um, when it comes to candidate ads, uh, it's usually, you know, broadcasters are not in a position to be doing uh, detective work to figure out if each and every uh, complaint is not true. However, um, you know, there are times where broadcasters have asked, hey, you know, this, this does seem quite questionable. I, you know, can we have some proof that, that this, this is something they said? This was a quote they actually used. Um, but you know, in the fast moving political scheme, we're not saddled with the responsibility, nor should we be of verifying every claim. At some point the, the viewer has to be able to discern uh, right from wrong. But again, if something is, is uh, brought to a broadcaster's attention, each one's gonna handle it differently. Um, that does strike them as pretty patently false. That's something they will follow up on. And we, we, this happens you know, quite frequently. So, Commissioner, to you, obviously Facebook um, took a lot of heat when it's refused to fact check political ads. And what should 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 Facebook be fact checking? What should be the role? How how would you how do you do that? And who should be making the determination as to what is and isn't truthful? Well, you know, I do think this is a challenging question, and everybody says the same thing. Well, I don't want to be the speech police. I don't I don't want to be the truth police. I don't want that to be me. And and I literally do not want that to be me. I. I I think there would be serious First Amendment problems with the government trying to do that. Um, uh, and then Facebook turns around and says, well, we don't want to do it either. But on the other hand, they actually do do it for a lot of other things. Uh, they, they sort of routinely do fact checks on a lot of uh, other kinds of advertising and information that is going on on their uh, uh, platform. And I, and I think they should, you know, they should take down information that is just blatantly untrue uh, that could potentially harm people. Uh, uh, and they will do it in the electoral context if it is f fake information about um, the mechanics of voting. You know, if somebody wanted to put information out about that said, oh, the election's been canceled or it's been moved to a different day or something like that, they would take that down. So um, they're, they're, they've already dipped their toes in the water there. Um, they have drawn a line that um, I'm sure they think is defensible, but even people at Facebook, some of their own employees have uh, written a fairly persuasive letter saying that they are not comfortable with the standpoint that Facebook has taken. I think that there is uh, something to the notion of having uh, offloading the responsibility to some neutral uh, group, third party representing a diversity of perspectives. You know, there are organizations like NewsGuard that have set up to try and do, provide some kind of fact checking on, on what you're seeing online, but you have to know to download their browser extension in order to take advantage of that. And of course, uh, and, and Facebook claims to have uh, for ads that aren't run by candidates, uh, they do have uh, a, a group that they turn to to do that kind of fact checking. Of course, it's really critical to know who is in that group and, and whether uh, all of the players in that group are in pursuit of truth. Jennifer, something that the commissioner said reminded me of another issue is in about political ads, but that, that um, kind of highlights this overall point uh, that we're discussing right now is the, <clears throat> the role of the platform in deciding what's true and what's not. You know, recently, and it's got some headlines, which is why I'm mentioning it, um, a group had filed in D.C. at the FCC um, to hold broadcasters effectively liable for airing the president's, you know, briefings they've been doing on coronavirus. Again, not under political advertising, clearly, but, you know, under a, a broader public interest uh, standard. Now, putting aside the fact that it, it wasn't based on any actual FCC regulation that, that applied. So it was, it was kind of thrown out out of hand. But again, that gets to this difficult position that um, folks find themselves in. You know, the, the president's giving a briefing, you know, um, you would assume that's the national issue you'd want to cover. But, you know, some people are raising issues. Oh, well, uh, since there are things that are not true on there, uh, therefore the platform, in this case, broadcaster should be held liable. Again, the FCC um, may 
quick work of that and, and put it to the side, but it is an interesting conversation. This, came, this uh, was an issue recently with um, Twitter and, and Facebook and Google all took down statements that the Brazilian president had said um, on the grounds that it was, it was perpetuating mistruths about cures for the coronavirus as well. Um, Rick, this is another question to you. Um, uh, a question about um, your statement earlier that it was difficult to define controversial issues of public importance. And um, the, the questioner um, is asking about whether or not that is still true given guidance that the commission issued on this question um, it looks like some time ago in 1978. Um, and that's the, the questioner um, suggests that with this definition, with this clarification, the definition is, is fairly workable. Um, so I wanted some clarification as to your sense as to what the ongoing problem is. Yeah, I think, I think workable is, 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 they've gone away from workable. Uh, I, I think the problem is uh, it's, it's maybe clearer in some ways because the way the FCC is now clarifying it, it seems to us to apply to almost anything. Um, so it, a national issue of importance is, is you know, such an amorphous term um, you know, we had, we had sort of pushed the FCC, hey, look, if, if, it's, if it's something that involves, um, you know, a, a critical feature of it, it should involve something that um, is being debated by that um, race. So let's say it's two congressional candidates and we're talking about uh, immigration policy, that's certainly a national issue of legislative importance, you know, it's something, but if it's the mayoral race, um, uh, you know, uh, somewhere in Iowa, and it's about healthcare and they can't influence it all. Now, that, that doesn't seem to be the same, but the FCC has, has, at least appears to me, has defined it as, okay, any issue of national importance that you happen to be talking on the water cooler or wherever else, that's now swept in. And that just, again, to, to us, I think that, that broadens it way too much, uh, not only because the, the burdens that it now uh, applies, but it's, it's, it's missing the point of what, you know, I talked about the, the moving, or shifting sands here on what it, what the purpose was, but even if you adopt a new purpose, which is transparency, uh, trying to figure out who's advertising about what, uh, as the commissioner mentioned, and how much they're they're spending, um, you, you want to have it fairly, I think, narrowly tailored to issues that matter that you want to know that the people can have actually influence over, and they're issues that that are being debated by Congress because you're trying to figure out the influence of money in politics. I think that's what it comes down to, but but at this point. And again, because it's a hard thing to define, I'm not saying the FCC had an easy task. It does strike me that it got pretty broad uh, and now it's, 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 it waters the whole thing down. And so broadcasters are gonna be really over-inclusive as they report these things. And I'm not sure it's gonna ultimately be uh, useful to those um, you know, studying these issues. And so the, the consequences are disclosure consequences. Are there consequences beyond the disclosure consequences? Uh, no, it's really it's really dis disclosure consequences that I'm that I'm talking about. Right, and so and what are the and the risks and what are the risks of over disclosure? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's not it's not no one's gonna be harmed, um, no loss of life. Uh, I think what we're talking about is, um, let's say you're 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 studying, you you have a bunch of students come in, want to study a project, and you want to study what issues are being covered, how often they're being covered, are being advertised about, where where they're being advertised about, how much money is being spent. Um, you're not going to want to wade through lots of files of things that are not really pertinent. Uh, they're tangential. Uh, and so I think for, because again, I, I don't think this was the purpose of the of BICRA originally or any of the iterations, but it sort of becomes something that I know the FCC has adopted, which is this notion of academics studying these issues, you know, should have access to these uh, kinds of things. I do think it makes that process harder for them because uh, for, for us in the broadcasting world to not be subject to fines for non-disclosure or not sufficient disclosure, uh, the, the incentive is to over-disclose, um, which in some ways you might not think is a bad thing, but here it's not helping anybody by having the more issues included when you disclose. Um, you really want to know, was this a healthcare ad or not? Because I want to know, um, I'm studying healthcare ads and how much was spent. Yes, yeah, although you could imagine that there might be different views on what constitutes a healthcare ad or a non-healthcare ad. And so you could imagine that some people would think there's no real harm in having additional information as opposed to less information in that situation. Yeah, but I think, 
I guess so, but then, but even the way the disclosure works, so uh, the only way you wouldn't include a non, uh, something, let's say there's a debate over whether it's healthcare or not, somebody would put that even under the current regime over disclosing, um, you would, if you thought it was a different issue, you'd put it down as a different issue. So it still wouldn't count as a healthcare ad, even with older disclosure. What I'm talking about is um, issues that weren't really the, our, our main point, to maybe boil this down is, what I think people really care about is what is the main focus of the ad? What is the ad really trying to convey? So in other words, let's say it's a, it is a, un, no one would debate it's a healthcare ad. So you have a healthcare ad and at the very end of the ad, it lists like six issues that the candidates for that they think will, you know, just list them on the screen. Um, our view is it's a healthcare ad. You should, that's it's useful to people to know they're advertising about healthcare. The other issues, um, if you put them in, that sort of waters down the, I think the meaning of, and the importance of that ad. And now though, um, it appears that what the FCC has clarified is that you have to list those issues at the end too. That again, they might've just thrown up on a screen at the end uh, to say this candidate also supports, you know, this kind of immigration and this political candidate and this, you know. So I think that's, that's our, our only point. Um, from a selfish, you know, from, a, you know, from, from our point of view, so stepping back from the pure public interest, the other issue for us is that, you know, unfortunately, there are some groups that look for these foot faults, as we call them. Oh, we you had five, uh, you had five uh, of the six issues that the person doing the ad, who's like an, a sales rep, right, uh, missed the sixth issue, was about something that actually is a matter of national importance. They didn't think it was, but it was. Thankfully, the FCC has clarified that it's it's your best judgment uh, for the person doing that. So that that's that that helps us quite a bit because we're just worried about. Um, being held liable for something that was not intentional. I think we probably have time for one last question, which I'm going to direct to you, Commissioner, which is a question about how is micro-targeting any different than targeted direct mail? Well, I, th I think it really comes down to what the platforms know about you and how, how very narrow the targeting groups are. Um, I, I think direct mail just doesn't have the same kind of inf information. Your mailbox doesn't know um, uh, about you, everything that your laptop does, and that the platforms suck out of all the information, all of the interactions that you have online. Uh, so I, I just think it's, it's a question of how narrow the focus is. And I, I know based on complaints that we get at the FEC on a regular basis that no matter how they try and target the mail, they always, they, they always end up getting the mail in somebody's box that they weren't really intending because we get complaints based on those things. I got this mailer and, and you know, it, it was misleading or it was this or it didn't have the disclaimer on it. Um, so I know that they miss on the, uh, on the targeted mail, but it's just a much narrower slice in, uh, on the internet. The direct mail makes mistakes, whereas micro-targeting online is way too accurate. Um, please join me um, with a virtual round of applause for two wonderful panelists. Thank you so much for spending an hour with us. Really appreciate it. Um, this podcast will be up tomorrow on New America as part of the Free Speech Project uh, at Future Tense, sorry, Future Tense, which is a collaboration of um, ASU, Slate, and New America. Um, it will be on the website. Thank you, Rick Kaplan. Thank you, Commissioner Weintraub. And thanks to all of you who are watching. Thank, Thank you, you Jen. Much.